John Hustler, Per Kussell and Torsten Persson are engaged in a project on how to integrate economic and climate models. And I, for one, am very happy that this is happening at the Institute, which is the leading Swedish economic research institute. It's important that such an institute makes an effort in this important area. I will shortly introduce you to the panel, but before I do that, I'm happy to introduce Ms. Lena Ek, the Swedish Minister of the Environment. Ms. Ek has had a long and distinguished political career, including many years as an MP, both in the Swedish Parliament and in the European Parliament, and as such she has worked with, with environmental policy for many years. Lena Ek will give you an introductory statement as a kick-off to our panel. The rostrum is yours, Lena, please. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's a great privilege and an honor to introduce this discussion on one of the greatest environmental challenges of our time. I cannot think of a more ideal setting than the Institute for, the International Econo for International Economic Studies and the gathering of such distinguished scholars and economists when looking for solutions to the climate change crisis. I believe that the solution will have to be sought in the crossroads between politics, science and economics. The OECD Environmental Outlook to 2030 that was published only this spring has analyzed why policy, what policy actions are needed to address the key challenges. And we're Without new policies, we risk irreversibly damaging the environment and the natural resource base needed to support economic growth and well-being. The OECD report tells us very clearly that carbon pricing can raise revenues. Implementing the emission reduction pledges of industrialized countries through carbon taxes or cap-and-trade schemes, of course, with fully auctioned permits should, could result in fiscal revenues of over 0.6% of GDP in 2020, more than US dollars 20, 250 billion. This is sound economic policy. Sweden has a carbon tax of 150 US dollars per ton and still boasts sound fiscal order and a growing economy. In the 2012 Global Risks Report from World Economic Forum, rising greenhouse gas emissions is listed as the third highest global risk for business in terms of likelihood after things like chronic fiscal imbalances and severe income disparity. That is a higher ranking than rampant corruption, extreme volatility in energy and agriculture sectors and recurring liquidity crisis. Sustainable living should be simple, affordable and attractive, and policies must be put in place that can make this happen in all countries. A close contact and dialogue between decision makers and researchers is necessary. In Sweden, an environmental advisory council composed of top researchers and shared by myself as environment minister has recently been established. The purpose of this council is to underpin the environmental policy with a solid scientific base. And the council will also seek to identify areas in need for new research and contribute to a more informed policy debate. We know the costs associated with global inaction. Much thanks to Sir Nicholas. But there is a case for countries to act even as others do not or do little. Business is moving at a rate that was not predicted only six years ago. Technology is changing. How do we invest more in green technologies and how do we accelerate that change? Economic scientists need to speak up on the benefits of early action and of moving forward for different sectors of the economy as well for, as for society as a whole. The potential benefits are huge. We need to trigger a race to the top to push the agenda forward on climate change 
both on local, national, and a global level. And, on the other end, business has to be aware of technology, technology shifts. And technology shifts always means winners and losers, as we all know. In April this year, Sweden hosted the Stockholm Plus 40 Partnership Forum for Sustainable Development, a commemoration of the first global conference on environment in Stockholm 1972. The Stockholm Conference on the, of the Human Environment. This event was hosted by the Swedish government as a platform for debate in the lead up to the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development. Ministers, scientists, business representatives, civil society and youth from 74 different nations were actively involved in the event. The outcome of the discussions was summarized the Stockholm Call for Action which highlighted the need to integrate all parts of society in decision-making and the need to develop practices that enable individuals to meet their needs and aspirations while at the same time acting responsibly towards present and future generations by respecting the natural boundaries of our ecosystems. It is my ambition to maintain this spirit of dialogue in all levels of decision-making and uh, to solve the biggest environmental crisis that we've seen, we need partnership between economists, scientists and politicians. And I see this conference as a necessary part of this work. And good luck to you and I'm look looking forward to see amazing results. Thank you. Just a quick question um, before you leave. A, a couple of months ago, you met with uh, U.S. Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, um, in a much publicized meeting here in Stockholm, actually. And together you put forth a proposal on how to reduce emissions of what is called short-lived climate pollutants, soot, methane, and so on. Can you just tell us quickly what's happened so far? Have you seen any results yet? Uh, yes. <laughs> That's a quick answer. The... Uh uh, the short-lived climate pollutants are those who stay for a shorter time in the atmosphere than the one who is no negotiating within the multilateral systems of, of, of the United Nations. Uh, depleted also methane uh, and, and particles in the air, for example. And they are affecting human health, uh, harvests, and the climate. So this is the win-win situation, and we decided on the format for this and the working methods uh, actually during the climate conference in Durban in a small office that was placed in the parking garage, which is maybe symbolic, uh, under the conference hotel. Uh, anyway, uh, this is uh, a, no discussion about science. This is all countries that uh, enter the coalition provide an action list and financing. And we now have 18 countries, including G8, uh, U.S. and that's of course why why Secretary Clinton is is uh, uh, extremely interested in uh, in this coalition. Uh, the World Bank is there, so there's financing, and uh, the the board is established. The Secretariat is established together with UNEP in Paris. Uh, the first decision, decisions have been taken. The member countries has delivered their action plans and the first projects were decided uh, last week. And I think uh, for an international negotiation like this, uh, to have this in place only since December is maybe well worth it. Thank you. It's an interesting example of a coalition of the willing, perhaps. Exactly. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, give her a hand, for God's sake. <laughs> thank you. Now, let me introduce our panel in alphabetical order. Uh, first is Michael Greenstone of MIT, who is not visible here at the table. But um, we'll see if technology works. You might be able to see him shortly up on the big screen. For a while, we were worried that Michael would occupy the empty chair of this panel, with us being Clint Eastwood or something like that. He had to cancel his Stockholm trip with very short notice, but due to the technical prowess here of the organizers, Heels with us with a hopefully working video link from Boston. Yes, we can. 
Michael is professor of environmental economics at MIT, as well as a fellow at Brookings. His research concerns uh, costs and benefits of environmental quality and our environmental policy. So he has had a particular interest in the effects of government regulation. I should also add that Michael chaired President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors in 2009. It's at, so far you can see him over there, and his slides will come up over there. We'll see how this works out. Next in order is John Hustler. Uh, of the Institute. He's a professor of economics here in Stockholm. His main work has been in macroeconomics and, and political economy, and he's also vice chairman of the Swedish Fiscal po Policy Council, which assesses the government's fiscal policy. But he, the reason he's here today is also that he's active in environmental economics, and at present he's working on a project with aims to link economic and climate models. Next in line is Elizabeth Moyer at the University of Chicago. She's the only, the only non-economist in this panel. She's a professor at the Department of the Geophysical Sciences at the University of Chicago. She's also co-director of something, and listen to this, she's co-director of the, the University's Center for Robust Decision Making on Climate and Energy Policy. You should, we should have one of those in Sweden. A Center for Robust Decision Making. Um, the reason she's with us here today is also she heads a multi-institutional project to, which also works with designing a large-scale integrated model framework to analyze climate change, energy policy, and the whole, everything, more or less. An even vaster undertaking than Jones. And then we have, still in alphabetical order, Hans Werner Sinn of the IFO Institute. Professor Sinn is probably best known as the president of the IFO Institute of Economic Research. He's the director of the Munich Center for Economic Studies. His research covers many areas, including macroeconomics and economic policy. He's a member of the Economic Council of Economic Advisors to the German Minister of Finance. But he's also done research in environmental economics, not least on how efficient policy measures should be shaped. I should add, by the way, that the newspaper The Independent last year named him one of ten people who are changing the world. And last but not least, in alphabetical order, we have Nicholas Stern from the London School of Economics, uh, previously, among other things, Chief Economist at the World Bank, but in this context, uh, probably best known as the main author of the Stern Review, a bold and thorough attempt to put numbers on the costs of climate change and to outline global and efficient strategy to mitigate these effects. I think it's fair to say that the Stern Review was extremely important in making climate change a tangible and concrete issue on the political agenda. Now, the outline here is that all panelists will make introductory, rather brief statements, five, six minutes or so, uh, which the rest of the panel is, has to come to very shortly, but then we will have a general discussion on some of the broader topics. And I've asked Nicholas Stern to be the first uh, to make these introductory statements to make an overview, uh, what are the recent developments in science and global policy making? The task is becoming more urgent, but why is it so difficult to reach policy cooperation? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the IIF for uh, living 50 years and inviting us to the celebration and living so productively. Uh, Maybe yes. we should Can you hear me now? That's better. Yeah. yeah. Th thank you uh, for having me. Thank you to the IES for living so long and being so productive in the process and for inviting us here to celebrate. I want to talk about the uh, economics of policy. It's the job of economists, one of the jobs of economists, to try to contribute in a constructive way to the analysis of policy. But they have to do that in this context. It's crucial in a way that is consistent with uh, creating or contributing to the political will to actually take decisions. And I think in this context, it's the political will which is the biggest constraint to uh, strong action. I will talk mostly about the political will to uh, cut emissions, about mitigation. Because that's moving much too slowly, adaptation is going to loom uh, very large, but that's not where I'll we have, before getting into the detail of policy and how we express ourselves in a way that's not only accurate and consistent with the problem, but likely to be convincing, I want to note, and it is important, I hope it's obvious, why it is in this context that it's so difficult. 
and it comes pretty directly from the science, but it's not only the science that creates the difficulties. One is that these effects are very uncertain. Secondly, they happen quite a long way down the track in relation to the actions. And third, their public good sits to some total of the emissions. It's not the science's fault that these are the features, but they are the features that the science tells us. And each one of those, each one, makes decision-making very difficult. The combination makes it extremely difficult. Secondly, there are very powerful vested interests. They're powerful vested interests in most policies we discuss, but they're very powerful in this context. And thirdly, there are severe dangers of delay, which are not generally recognized. So that because of problems long term, you think you can kick it down the road, but it, this one gets much more difficult if you try. Why? Because concentrations, the, uh, this is a process of flows of emissions going into stocks, concentrations, there's a ratchet effect there, because CO2 in particular is very difficult to get out. And secondly, the long lock-ins of um, high carbon infrastructure, if we, and capital, if you put those together, it does make life very difficult for decision making. But not impossible. If we thought it was impossible, we'd just uh, get big hats and write apologetic letters to our grandchildren. We have to try to find a way through this one. I think we can, but we have to do rather better than we have been doing. So let me talk about the response. First, let's think about the scale of the response. If we are to control uh, temperature increases, to ranges that uh, are not hugely dangerous. It's going to be dangerous anyway. So this is a question of whether we play Russian roulette with two bullets in the barrel or one bullet in the barrel, and it's much more attractive to do it with one bullet in the barrel with two. We can't remove all the risk, but we can substantially, substantially reduce the risk. If we're to control to anything like 450, 500 parts per million CO2 equivalent, if we're to get anywhere close to 50-50 chance of holding to 2 degrees, we have to cut emissions per unit of output over the next 40 years by a factor of 6, 7, 8. We have to divide emissions per unit of output over 30 or 40 years by a factor of 6, 7, or 8. Now, that immediately tells us that this is about an energy industrial revolution. It's really radical change. So the first thing we have to think about in the, we describe the response is a recognition of just how big that change has to be. Is it technologically feasible? I think there's strong evidence that it is. And if you look just in the six years since the Stern Review was published at the very rapid progress in uh, cutting the costs of solar, just looking at electricity, if you look at the way that cars have changed, who would have thought the electric motor, who would have thought the General Motors would be making electric cars? six or seven years ago. If you look at technical progress in insulation materials, you've seen dramatic change. Enough to convince us that these, uh, this radical reduction is really possible in emissions. You know, well, of course, associated with radical reduction in absolute emissions. Is it attractive? Well, on the whole, energy industrial revolutions are periods of, you can some people count three, some people count five, it depends where you look at the waves of technology. But you see a few decades of creativity, innovation, and growth. They're dynamic periods. They're periods of discovery. And in this case, we're talking about a route towards something that's more energy secure, more energy efficient, cleaner, quieter, safer, more biodiverse. So there are lots of bonuses in this one beyond the reduction fundamental that is, the risk of climate change. So it is possible. It is attractive. What kind of policies are going to generate it? Well, I generally focus on six basic market failures. Greenhouse gas externality, obviously. But there's research and development. There's networks, public transport, grids, broadband, which are fundamental to So that's three fundamental externalities. We've got long-term risk capital markets, which we know have their uh, deep problems, particularly important in this context. Because it's such a learning process, information is central, and there are all these other benefits which kick in, for example, in biodiversity as well. All these six are big. Not one of them is small. Some of them are familiar from other contexts, but they're intensely important here. So we mustn't just think of this as being about a price of carbon. Of course it must be there. That's the first one on the list. 
It's also R&D, but it's not just the price of parts and R&D, it's those other things as well, all of which require public policy and direct attention. It, so start with these market failures. It's a very good way, I think, of beginning to this story of transition. But we also need the power of the example. I had the privilege of working for six years as the chief economist of the uh, EBRD, which was working directly on a transition towards the market economy in the uh, Central Eastern Europe and the former uh, Soviet uh, Union. Eric Berglock here today is the current chief economist. This was a story where the whole thing turned on the power of the example. As a fraction of total investment, that institution was small, but it could give very strong examples. And the more of those we get, I think the more you'll get people to understand the feasibility and attraction of the story. Let me turn very briefly, and it has to be briefly, to the challenges of linking national action and international action. Sometimes people say, you know, nothing will happen unless you have a treaty. Sometimes you hear people say, treaties are for the birds. Everything has to come from the country level. I think clearly those two statements are both false. The willingness to act at the national level depends on where people think international discussion is going. The progress of international discussion depends on what people see in their own economies as possible and what they see other people are doing. These two things are tightly interwoven. We're making progress on both, but actually painfully slow on both of those things. But let's not kill ourselves, we can drop either one or the other. The second thing is to recognise whilst that uh, progress is slow, there has been progress. At Copenhagen, you know, chaotic and quarrelsome and cold though it was, it was a place where for the first time emissions reductions were put on the table. I don't think China would have put emissions reductions on the table. And those emissions reductions have stuck and have been integrated for 12 by the plan. I think the United States would have put those emissions on the table. What the credibility of those are, uh, what they did put on the table, we'll have to see. But I find the Chinese reactions which were the 12 by the plan. In Cancun, the things that were only noted at Copenhagen, the Copenhagen Accord was only noted, was transformed into national agreement, and for the first time that meant that the two degree target became an international target. The Green Climate Fund was established. At uh, Durban, it was recognised for the first time, the gap between the two degree target was articulated and the emissions reduction was on the table. And it was recognised for the first time that we would have to have for international agreement some kind of integrated responsibility. We have to see what that means, but the old Kyoto division into the, um, into the two parts, crudely rich and uh, poor countries, would not be the basis over the medium term. All these things are important progress, but slow, 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 and uh, it means that as time goes by, the whole story gets more difficult. The international process does depend on mutual understanding. I've testified three times in Congress in the US. Each time, the conversation has been about China. I mean, why do they want a British person to come and talk to them about China? It's a question of understanding of where other people are going and China is starting to move. Those of you who don't read the uh, Chinese 12th five-year plan at bedtime, I suggest you mend your ways and start doing exactly that. China, of course, is growing in so fast that still its emissions are rising. I don't want to be uh, saying everything is wonderful, but there's a real process of change to come through recognition of risk, a recognition of China's uh, size, and a recognition there's a green race going on that China would rather like to win. And, you know, I would, <laughs> they may well. The, so what, in conclusion, can we do as economists to present our story, present our arguments in a way that really is honest and just in relation to the problem, but also has a chance of traction? I think the biggest priority for research in economics now in this area is how to promote this new energy industrial I offered some ideas, they were only the beginnings. There are others, some people here, um, Darren Azimoglu and his associates, Philippe Aguillon and his associates. Institute in Stockholm, who are working on that. But for me, that's the big priority, to try to get people to understand just how attractive this can be, what's involved in making it happen. We can't kid people that everything is win-win-win. Industrial revolutions, like revolutions, leave blood on the carpet. Unless they dislocate, they're not working. So 
it's very attractive, there's lots going on, but it's going to be uh, change, change which is dislocation which we have to deal with. A second thing I think is very important is to get people to understand that this is a world which is moving in that direction and if you don't, before long, you could well get shut out of markets. Um, why would uh, countries that have made a big effort 10 years down the track accept dirty inputs? They'd ask you to stop subsidising the dirty uh, exports that you're sending and if, because uh, not taxing carbon is, uh, is a subsidy and they would have every right to uh, levy barriers. So uh, emphasising the dangers 10 years down the track, not tomorrow, but 10, 15 years down the track of getting shut out. And the last thing I think that we can emphasise is the link at least in rich countries, between pulling out of the recession and medium-term growth. We can see that the medium-term growth has to be low-carbon growth. High-carbon growth couldn't possibly make sense in the medium term. The logic of your uh, reflationary packages should fit with your pattern of medium-term growth. So there's an advantage here. Some sensible countries like Germany are rising to that. Uh, some less sensible countries like my own want to rise to that but are uh, taking a bit longer. I would refer, for example, to um, big insulation of houses and buildings, which is exactly the right way to employ lots of people in housing, but is uh, moving much more rapidly in some countries than in others. These are the kinds of ways, I believe, that we can articulate the story. I don't want to pretend it's win-win-win. It will involve big investment. It will involve costs. will involve some dislocation. But it's actually a rather attractive path and the other path is really just a non-starter in terms of the uh, immense damages it could bring. Thank you. I hope I'm not vulgarizing what you said, but let me try nonetheless to, not vulgarize, but to simplify the conclusion. Even though some things are getting better after these conferences and the market forces are sometimes pulling us in the right directions, the institutional sort of setup of national vested interests, etc., etc. I don't have to repeat that. What you're saying, in a sense, is it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's too slow. It's too slow, okay. Um, now, let's see. We have a technical problem because up on the screen is Michael's slides, and we are now going to turn to John Hustler. We will come back to policy making. Hans Werner and Michael will talk about policy. But we will now have two uh, contributions to how economists and scientists can cooperate uh, before we go back into policy conclusions. And John, please, if we have... Yep, here we go. Thank you, uh, Klaus. Um, I have the advantage of feeling a little bit at home here. This is where I usually teach undergraduate students macroeconomics. And uh, one of the disadvantages with this big aula is, aula is that one cannot see if one gets boring and the students fall asleep. But Klaus, I will see if you fall asleep, so, so tell me then. Because I was, gonna, I was thinking of go, taking a step backward from what we just heard and, and say a few words about how we uh, work, uh, in particular here at the Institute, with uh, uh, bringing macroeconomics and the natural science together. And this is work that is done with uh, Per Cressel and Conny Olofsson and, and others. Uh, so, so basically, we uh, try to uh, uh, build climate economy modeling from three basic uh, uh, blocks. Uh, the first one being a climate uh, block or a climate model. Uh, Liz is the expert here. I, I know very little, but I have tried to condense out a little bit of, of how this works. And the climate models, of course, tell you how distribution of weather events, uh, storms, rain and temperature, how these things uh, evolve over time and how they're affected by, in particular, uh, uh, changes in the, in the uh, energy balance between incoming and outgoing radiation caused by, for example, uh, emission of greenhouse gases. So that's the first element. Uh, the second element, uh, building block in the models, are, are carbon circulation models. Uh, which uh, basically describe what happens to carbon emitted to the atmosphere. These models are, are uh, based on, on 
pools of carbon consisting of, of in particular the atmosphere, obviously, but also the oceans and the biosphere, uh, plants and even carbon in ourselves, and describe how emitted carbon to the atmosphere uh, uh, mixes in the atmosphere and eventually moves to the different pools and how the circulation works. And this is, of course, uh, a necessary ingredient if you want to understand how uh, 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 the carbon concentration in the atmosphere over time is going to be affected by the, the emission that we do. Uh, these, two, these two elements I'm, uh, I know extremely little of, uh, but we have a very good cooperation with uh, people who do know, and I think this has been very uh, important. What we contribute to uh, is, is the economy model. Uh, as, as Nick said, uh, these are long-run problems, so we need really long-run models. These are macroeconomic problems, they're global problems, we need global macroeconomic models for, to understand these things. Models that can take into account how people make decisions about investments, how people make policy decisions, uh, and, uh, and do this in, in a setting where expectations about the future are very important for, for what happens now, which decisions are taken. So these are the three building blocks, and what we try to do is to put these together. Um, and the obvious uh, uh, link here is that the economy uh, is producing the carbon emissions that goes into the carbon circulation system. Carbon circulation system determines the atmospheric concentration of, of, of CO2 uh, over time, uh, and this in turn feeds into climate models by affecting the energy balance. And finally, this feeds back into the economy in various ways. And this is kind of the simplest way uh, of thinking of, of the models we are working on, but we should also recognize that there are these links are, in principle, very compli and complicated and bi-directional and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and a kind of a fully-fledged uh, integrated um, assessment model, a uh, climate economy model, needs to take into account these, all these, these, uh, these mechanisms. Um, in order to be able to do this, uh, and this is a thing that we have kind of had to convince our national science uh, uh, friends about is that we need to simplify a lot. We can't, we can't de deal with models that are as complicated as the national scientists do. And this is basically due to the fact that our models are inhabited by people who look forward. There are many different possible scenarios that ca could happen. And to, in the economy, we have to kind of evaluate all of them. So it makes it very difficult. So we need to, in order to bring, to do something like this, we need to simplify extremely. Um, the climate model might be one or two or three equations rather than the thousands that, that Liz uses. Uh, otherwise, we can't handle it. So one might then ask the question, do we really need to do this? Is there any point in, in, in bringing the economists in? And, and here I would actually also, also like to say that, that this is a relevant question because macroeconomists have been very slow to enter this area. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular macroeconomists, economists, not the least Pat and I, who have been working with this for maybe three or four years or something. But nevertheless, I think the answer is that we need to, 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 to bring in macroeconomists, and, and uh, I encourage everyone here who, who still uh, thinks of what to do uh, to go into this area. It's very rewarding and interesting. And we need uh, macroeconomists to answer questions like what is the cost of climate change? Uh, um, how high are the costs and benefits of different policies, and are they effective or not? Um, uh, uh, which, if we can choose between different policies, what, what, which are the most cost-effective. Uh, and here I think that actually very, quite s fairly simple and standard models uh, of the global economy are powerful tools, but of course one always has to realize that uh, we are not dealing in an exact science, uh, and uh, results depend on, on assumptions, and assumptions can never exactly capture reality. So we shouldn't expect absolute truths. So having said that, let me just say a little bit of current research that we are doing. And this is very, very current in the sense that some of these calculations that lie behind these results were done, what was it, Pat, like a week ago or something? Uh, so these are certainly not truths, but at, at least examples. <clears throat> so let's take an important question. 
should. Uh, does a European unilateral tax lead to leakage in the sense that if we introduce a tax on, on, on fossil emissions or coal, coal or oil, does that only lead to uh, that uh, even if consumption goes down here, it increases somewhere else? In order to answer this question, we really need to understand how markets work. Uh, we need a quantitative understanding of, of, of these, and what we try to do is to take a very simple macroeconomic model, <clears throat> global model, put in these markets and see what happens, if we can answer this question. John, and John I just want to be rude. You emit too many words, <laughs> and I will have to mitigate your emissions shortly. <laughs> okay, so, so if I just can answer this question, uh, and uh, the question is, yes, uh, reductions in oil consumption in Europe almo is almost fully offset. If we tax oil here, uh, oil increase somewhere else is going to go up. No, reductions in European coal consumption, on the other hand, are not likely to be offset. And, but the oil leakage, the fact that if we reduce oil consumption here, it goes up somewhere else, it's not very important for welfare. We shouldn't care about that. On the other hand, European coal reductions here are, do not lead to re increases elsewhere, but they are too small to be of any quantitative importance. Thus, international cooperation or demonstration effects or effects via technology are, are key if we want to motivate uh, unilateral policies here. So that's an example. I've stopped there. Are these results robust? As I said, they clearly depend on the assumptions, and, but the, the, the kind of nice thing with the kind of modeling that we do is that models are relatively transparent. Students who have taken a graduate macroeconomic course can go in and change it and see, and one can discuss uh, to what extent these things, uh, how robust they are. And, and that's really necessary. We cannot trust one model. Bill Nordhaus has done a tremendous job uh, in doing something similar here, but we need, we need more people to work on this. Okay, thank you very much. And now we will hope that technology works wizardry once again, because Elizabeth Moyer is going to show slides too. Uh, John has told us about how to link climate and economic models in a simple way. And like John said, you are, as a geophysicist, um, into much more detailed modeling of scientific or natural science relations. Can you tell us, please, what you do and um, how you see possibly cooperation with economists? I will, but I cannot, I'm not a Windows person. If somebody can find the desktop to get my slides up here, that would be great. It should be on the... Uh, uh, yeah. There, right there. It's right here. It's right here. It's right here. Uh, and then slideshow. So you're an Apple person? Yes. <laughs> so I was, I was brought here supposedly to talk about applying uh, integrated assessment models to the energy sector. What do we do about actually mitigating emissions? Um, and I'd like to give my perspective also on the differences between climate scientists and economists because there has been some tension. So I was struck with the initial speaker's uh, discussions of the emphasis on the damages of climate change. Uh, Nick said, you know, we must be careful about the immense damages that climate change can bring. Uh, but in most economics modeling to date, there has not been an assumption of immense damages. So I'm showing you here, uh, if you look at the top figure, this is output from one of the models used in the United States Interagency Working Group on the Social Cost of Carbon. And it's the baseline case assumption without and with climate damages. And you can see that it's not an immense problem, climate change, because the assumption is that it will reduce our growth from being 30 times richer, 35 times richer in 2300 to merely being 30 times richer than today in 2300. So given, and that's the case when our CO2 is up at 900 ppm and our global mean temperature is 5 degrees warmer. 
So given that assumption, it is not surprising that the model would not predict a serious policy effort. And in fact, I would agree that if this is really the case, we should not have a serious policy effort. Why should I spend money now to help someone in the future who's going to be 30 times richer than me no matter what? So I'm in complete agreement with this. But a climate scientist would typically not have this assumption. Now, I, I do blame the climate scientists for their inability to think through economic terms because they haven't been very articulate about explaining what they tend to think. But if you talk to most climate scientists, they would assume that damage are more like this. So now I've just flipped this on the top page. You can see that, that trajectory there. And I've actually generated this from the same model. This is from Nordhaus's model as modified for the interagency working group. Uh, we simply apply the damages to the baseline factor productivity that drives economic growth rather than to output. So you can go from the top situation to that situation with a relatively simple change in a toy model. There's no justification for doing that, but there's no justification, I think, for any assumption about damages. So we have significant uncertainty that has direct implications for policy. Uh, and so I, I do believe this is the primary research effort that needs to go on. If we want to say, if we did somehow assume that damages are significant, and there was consensus on a policy, I want to give you a little bit of physical framework for what that policy uh, might consist of and how it would change the energy sector. So here's just a few bullet points, and then I'll try to give you some quick data to prove them. Uh, policies that mitigate climate change while keeping us wealthy, because we would like to stay wealthy. Uh, they'll produce switching of energy conversion technology, not primarily conservation. And this is what Nick said as well. Uh, switching technology means either a 50-year transition or it means steep costs. Carbon taxes, in the way that the economists would like to apply them, which is rational and efficient, will have little leverage on oil. Uh, they'll mainly affect coal, and that's because the price per carbon molecule in oil, in gasoline, is 10 times more than the price per carbon molecule in coal. So you're not going to do much to transportation. You'll hit the electric sector. Uh, so in, you might think of the purpose of, an, of a climate mitigation policy as trying to persuade people to leave some of the coal in the ground and not burn it. Okay, so here's the point, same thing that Nick said, growth always means an increase in energy use. This is data from the World Bank, it is supposed to be 1960 through 2011, some countries don't have full data. So I've given you every single country in the database minus some of the ones, major energy producers who are wasteful, East Bloc that went crazy, and little city and island states that, have, that are anomalous. Uh, and it shows you, you can see every country how it's evolved over the last, you know, roughly 40 years, 50 years. Uh, and you can see this trend. The wealthier you are, the more energy you use. And as you evolve and get wealthier, you use more energy. That's we what we consider wealth is largely energy use. There's some exceptions. USA has gotten wealthier while being static, but that's because we were so wasteful before. So we spent 50 years stopping being wasteful. Uh, okay, here's the world. So notice that USA is up there. Sweden is very high. Let's see if I can make this. Uh, here is Sweden in here, I think. Uh, here's the USA. Here we're using about 10 kilowatts per person, 8 to 10. Europe tends to sit around here, US sits around here. About a factor of two difference in energy intensity. But this is the world average. We just had three days of policy conversation about helping these people get up here. So if the previous economists are all successful and these people get up here, we'll increase energy use by a factor of five and that goes directly into emissions. This is the same thing Nick discussed. This is the big problem. To get wealthy, you use energy, uh, more energy, more emissions, uh, more emissions, more climate change. Here's China, by the way. Everybody talks about how fast China's growing. China's average per capita emissions of a person in China is still a fifth of that of a person in the United States. So China's a big country. They exceed the US as an emitter, but only because there's so many people, not because every individual person is responsible for high emissions. If China gets as big as the US, that's a billion people who are going to emit five times more CO2. OK, so energy use indestructibly tied to wealth. Just one little image that you can hold on to as a physical framework. If you count up your calories, your energy, think of yourself as a machine. You input fuel, you output mechanical work. The calories you eat per day for an average person uh, works out calories per day is energy per time. That's the same units of power, which is the same as watts. And we're all more comfortable with watts because we think about light bulbs. So your calories per day are about 100 watts. So that's more or less two light bulbs. Your two light bulbs is what is required to sustain your life. That is what people used when they were hunter-gatherers who hadn't even invented fire, right? If you're just walking around the earth eating, that's your, as a machine, you're a 100-watt machine. The average use for Americans, the power consumption is now 10,000 watts, inclusive of all the industrial power we use, which is effect, that's 100 times more. So it's effectively like we have 100 servants. Think of those machines as our mechanical people who are taking care of us. 
Uh, and it's very difficult when someone has 100 servants to persuade them not to have those servants. So it's very unlikely that we are going to persuade Americans to give up their servants, much less persuade the rest of the world not to have the same servants that we have now. So the idea that conservation will stop climate change is pretty much a done deal. It's not going to happen. Uh, you could hope that the previous economists fail to produce development uh, if you are willing to you know, have that moral stance. But uh, certainly, you can't persuade the rich world to, uh, to cease emitting or rather to cease using energy. And right now, energy use is inextricably tied to emissions because we're largely fossil fueled. That's a lot of, if you have 100 servants, that's a lot of people to feed. There's no way you can feed those people on biofuels, right? We're feeding them on old dead plants in the ground. That's what fossil fuels are. And so this is the correlation right now, and this includes the growth patterns of countries, uh, between per capita CO2 and per capita power use. And you can see that there's a very clear progression, right, that more energy use goes with more emissions because we're primarily a fossil fueled world. So switching away from that, that's a big, big problem, a big, difficult challenge. Uh, and the biggest challenge, and the reason it's also a modeling challenge for economic models, is that the energy sector is so infrastructure intensive. So there's not actually good inventories of the replacement costs of all the fossil fueled infrastructure. I've had done various estimates with students in my group, there's various other estimates in the literature. But you can certainly say replacement cost of all the fossil fuel infrastructure in the U.S. is of order one GDP. Might be less, probably a little bit less. You know, hard to actually count it up and what do you think about depreciation. But if we simply shut everything down and replace it tomorrow, it's about a GDP, which means you can't replace it tomorrow. There's nothing you can do. A turnover time of most of that infrastructure is 50 years. So. What does that mean? If you want to replace it, just at replacement value, at, with, with your regular replacement schedule, that's a 50-year transition. 50 years of emissions, we're already up at well over doubling of CO2. So if we do anything less than 50 years, that means we're throwing things away that are perfectly useful now. So how do you represent that in an economic model, the, the, the disuse of perfectly useful capital? Uh, well, in standard economic models, they don't treat capital that way. Either it's malleable so that your coal-fired power plant can magically turn into a wind farm, uh, or it's non-scrappable. If you make it not malleable, then you can't get rid of it. It has to still be used while it exists. So, so it does require some tinkering with the standard economic models in order to answer the question we want to answer, which is, what is it going to cost to not use some of the perfectly good stuff that we've built? And I should remind you that China's building coal-fired power plants at a rate of one a week, so there's plenty of these around. Um, I have some more slides, but that's the framework I wanted to give to you. Yeah. It's a bit scary, though. I mean, when you talk to economists about this, what is the best piece of advice that they give on how to speed up the switch that's so necessary, from your point of view? Well, I think, actually, there's less disagreement between climate scientists and economists than one would think. I would say that most climate scientists have seen their share of bad government programs, and if you talk to them, they will become very free market. They say, just price it and let the markets evolve and figure it out. And so most people who are thinking about it do agree with economists that the optimal efficient policy is to put a price on the thing that's bad and let the, let the free market work. Uh, that does mean you have to sort of give up on cars because you can't do much to gasoline but you can do the electric sector. I should point out, I looked up Sweden. Sweden has a bizarrely low energy intensity. So last night it was like, why is Sweden so virtuous? Uh, if I got the answers right, Sweden's electric sector is already almost completely decarbonized. Hmm. So what Wikipedia says is that you guys are half nuclear and half hydro. Yeah. But that means Sweden's already done everything easy. So I said the easy thing will be getting rid of coal. We'll be switching the electric sector, but you already did that. So you only have the hard stuff left. We picked we pick the low-hanging fruits. <laughs> uh, this, now, uh, we go back to more specifically then, or explicitly, policy making. Hans Werner Sinn, um, I'd like to... I mean, what we hear here is that higher price on carbon, higher price on oil might help, but you have sort of questioned that. You've said that uh, sometimes if we push too much on the demand side, we forget the supply side, so we get sort of a paradox here. I hope you will tell us something about the dangers of this kind of policy making. Yes, I will. But uh, let me first uh, congratulate the IIES for uh, its 50 years of great contributions to European economics. I uh, 
think all the directors have done a wonderful job and uh, I congratulate in particular Asa Lindbeck who I've always admired as a great economist who was, has been able to bridge academia and uh, public debate. Yeah, uh, so how can we improve uh, the climate problem, uh, solve the climate problem? Uh, we have uh, lots of technical devices. We know what we have to do in order to replace carbon, uh, fossil carbon, but um, that's not the difficulty. The difficulty is to make humans behave in a way uh, to um, use these technical devices. It's an organizational problem. And here we as economists are asked uh, to come up with solutions. Unfortunately, thus far, um, all the attempts which we have seen in Europe uh, and other countries in the world have not shown any result. If you see the European CO2 output, it has uh, declined strongly in my country enormously and others too. But uh, the worldwide CO2 output is growing like hell. Uh, you don't, do not see even a kink in the curve uh, because of the European activities. And that's a little bit frustrating. One wonders why this is the case. And um, I think um, it has to do with what you mentioned. The, 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 we focus on the wrong policies. Uh, if you read the newspapers over the weekend, uh, they are full of devices, these technical things which we can do, insulate our homes, drive smaller cars, uh, have windmills in the countryside, have uh, solar roofs and, and all. You know, we are experts. Every one of us is an expert here. But when you think about what these tools are, they would all just reduce the demand for fossil fuels. And as economists, we would uh, have to think about the supply side. Hmm? So we cannot just talk about the uh, demand side. If you want to have the transactions volume in the market, you have to have the other side of the market, trivially. And uh, here it's not so easy because uh, then we will have to talk about people like uh, the oil shakes, the coal barons, and Putin's uh, gas oligarchs. These are the guys who take the carbon out of the ground and make the supply decision. And as long as, uh, and, and before we understand how they behave, what their motivation is, we will not really be able to uh, come up with convincing policy conclusions. Uh, the mere attempt of reducing demand uh, will be useless if they stubbornly stick to whatever supply path they have uh, designed or have in their mind. Uh, because then if one country or a group of countries reduces the demand, they will just reduce the world price of carbon, implying that the rest of the world, which is not uh, following green policies, buys more of the carbon and exactly the same amount which uh, the others do not buy. Of course, you can have a carbon tax like in Sweden or Germany, uh, that reduces, given the world market price, the demand, but uh, the effect uh, is that it reduces the world price. It is not given, and uh, so because the world market price falls, someone else has to buy uh, the carbon, which comes out of the ground. Unless you convince the oil shakes and the others to keep the carbon in the ground, uh, which we do not consume. You will not achieve anything because the carbon coming out of the ground will be burned somewhere in the world. That's a very trivial, simple truth which we cannot escape. Of course, we can put the carbon back to the ground uh, sequestration, but uh, that's a different to topic uh, with limited technical possibilities I will not talk about now. Um, so what can we do? Uh, some people think, well, if we reduce the demand sufficiently, then we might be able to reduce the price of carbon below the production cost. Then the marginal suppliers will disappear from the market. That might be a possibility. 
but it's not so easy. What is marginal for, um, for uh, natural resource suppliers? It's not in an intertemporal context. All these things are a little bit difficult and different. The marginal supplier is, is not the highest cost supplier. Actually, it's the lowest cost supplier because the order of extraction goes, goes from the low to the high cost uh, fields. Uh, so that's not so easy. Actually, the price of extraction, the, the, the extraction cost nowadays for oil is just a seventh of uh, the market price. Uh, it's the same for gas, it's 50% uh, for coal. So you would have to reduce the market price of carbon quite a bit in order to come to the point where it's no longer profitable. In the, uh, in the Gulf states, it costs just... Uh, two dollars uh, to extract a barrel. The market price today is what, 130 or what? Uh, so, uh, however, do you can you hope by just reducing the market price to make it unprofitable not to take out the, this oil uh, from the ground? So that's not so easy. And what what is worse? Um, we might have a backfiring. Uh, uh, mechanism which you described, which I've called the green paradox, that is, <clears throat> if you do a lot of green saber rattling by announcing uh, a wonderful new world with uh, green technologies where we don't need the fossil carbon, this is, this is a declaration of war to the owners of the resources, and they will react by anticipating the sales. They will preempt the sales. They will extract as much as they can before this green new world comes where we have destroyed their markets. And I actually believe that has happened since the green movement came to existence in the early 80s because uh, the oil price since then in real terms has declined. It has not increased a bit, even the last few years a little bit. But uh, for 30 years we have had uh, falling or constant real oil prices. Uh, I, I think this has to do with the green saber rattling. These uh, oil shakes are not stupid. They know what is going on and they have increased their sales. Of course, there are other reasons for why they did that. There are lots of wars and uncertain property rights in these regions. But uh, whether you're uh, afraid that your rival will take over the throne and push your dynasty out and uh, expropriate your wealth, or whether you're afraid it's the Greens who do the same thing by destroying their markets has the same implication for the oil shakes behavior, so you hurry to get everything out of the ground and bring your wealth to a, a Swiss bank account. So this is a rather nihilistic result. Uh, we achieve very little. Then some people say, well, but we have to do something. It's just so frustrating. We want to do something. Well, if you have a good feeling, if you have a good, uh, if you like to do it, do it. But uh, that's, for me as an economist, not convincing. So what can we do? There are only two things we can do. Uh, first of all, we need quantity constraints. So a worldwide emissions trading system which fixes the quantities. Um, it's a social planning model, in a sense, but I, I think we cannot ultimately avoid it. And the second is, if you talk about incentives, um, a tax solution, but don't tax uh, the carbon which you take out of the ground, because it's not the rate of the tax, but it's change over time which creates economic behavior, and that's a very difficult animal to handle. handle. No, tax the alternatives. Uh, tax the Swiss bank account, uh, introduce a worldwide tax on uh, source tax on capital income, uh, making it more, att uh, more attractive for the owners of natural resources to leave their wealth in the ground rather than putting it to Swiss bank accounts. These are my only two solutions which uh, ultimately I find. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we will come back to this discussion uh, in the general session we'll have after the last uh, uh, <coughs> discussant because this is crucial when it comes to how the, the price mechanism works in, uh, for scarce resources. But uh, before that, um, it's Michael Greenstone now. John, can you change the, uh, so we can see Michael's slides over there? It's on the, oh, you can do it from there, sorry. Um, now, uh, we still don't know if the experiment works. We hope we can hear you, at least we can see you, those who sit in this part of the room. 
Uh, you've worked with policy dilemmas on the national level, with experiences from the US, of course. Um, but given the fact that mitigation of emissions seems to be hard to achieve, is there a plan B? What should the US do and what should other countries do? Please. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Uh, and I want to thank everyone at IES for the extraordinary efforts that have allowed me to participate in a carbon-friendly way, I should say. Um, and I want to apologize that I'm not able to join in person uh, festivities in honor of IIS's uh, 50 years of glorious history. Uh, but I am grateful for the opportunity to talk about the greatest challenge that I think our generation faces, uh, which is the rapid change in the planet uh, and that human behavior is causing that. Uh, I'm afraid that probably my views are a little bit uh, more pessimistic than some of the panelists, uh, although uh, strangely maybe cl more closely aligned with the geophysicists. Um, so let me begin by just noting uh, my, my talk has a, a few uh, observations uh, that I've centered the talk around. Uh, the observation one is that I think uh, there are really only four known climate change policies. Uh, the first is mitigation, which has been the topic uh, of a lot of uh, the panel so far. Uh, the second is the funding of basic R&D, which I think is an important part of any climate policy. The third, uh, we're not always allowed to talk about in polite company, uh, which is geoengineering. And then the fourth, which is the one I want to focus on a little bit today, is adaptation. And I think that's the weak sister or the uh, ignored stepchild uh, of climate policy too often. Uh, so. Those are the uh, four policy choices we have. Let me talk a little bit about why I think adaptation is uh, so important. So m my second observation uh, is, and none of these observations are groundbreaking, but they might help uh, illuminate things in a slightly different way, is that national mitigation policies have not generated a lot of enthusiasm outside of the EU uh, among developed countries. And as the next slide will indicate, I think that the reasons are not very surprising. Uh, what this figure shows is the cost of generating electricity uh, from a, a kilowatt hour of electricity from several different sources. And they're lined up uh, by uh, cheapest to most expensive. And on the left, you've got a kilowatt hour from an existing coal plant in the United States. Uh, that costs about 3.2 cents to produce a kilowatt hour. Uh, thanks to the advances in uh, drilling techniques in the United States, uh, which are now, I believe, are probably expanding around the world, uh, the cost of a kilowatt hour of new natural gas uh, from a new natural gas plant is just about 4.1 cents. And then on the right half, you can see how expensive it is to produce energy uh, using alternatives or low-carbon alternatives. And so let, let's just focus on uh, nuclear. Uh, from the, These estimates, which come from a paper of mine, suggest that it costs about 10.5 cents uh, to produce a kilowatt hour uh, of electricity uh, using nuclear. So that means that uh, we're effectively, to reduce carbon or to go to a low carbon strategy, we're effectively asking people to buy electricity that is 2.5 or 3 times uh, more expensive than what's available when one uses uh, fossil fuels. And I, I should note, uh, the I think the cost, the world, compared to even two or three years ago, uh, the world is suddenly awash in hydrocarbons. Uh, and I think that has probably become most evident in the United States, but it's going to be apparent around the world very soon. Uh, and that's due to the advances in drilling technology uh, and that have unleashed practically un unforeseeable amounts of natural gas and are beginning to unleash uh, incredible vast volumes of uh, petroleum. I think the genie is out of the bottle on that, and uh, it's going to be hard to put that back in. Uh, so the ne next observation, uh, which I think will have the uh, flavor of the master of the obvious, is that climate change can't be contained without cooperation from developing countries. And there's a couple ways that I want to try. I'm going to try and illustrate that with two graphs. Uh, the, the first is just that almost all of the projected increase in energy consumption uh, in, in the coming decades, and th this is well known, is going to come from uh, non-OECD countries. That's uh, the red line in this figure here. Uh, and w whereas the OECD countries are project, uh, projected, this is without uh, a carbon tax in most parts of the OECD, to basically be flat or slightly grow. Uh, and what does that, uh, and I think it might be helpful to unpack these numbers a little bit and look at the case of China. 
Uh, and here, this is in the next figure, uh, which is not up on your screen. Uh, there it is. Uh, which shows China's projected carbon emissions uh, under a baseline case, and that's the full line. Uh, and then uh, their projected emissions under kind of a standard division of responsibilities around the world if they were to undertake a five, uh, if the world were to collectively undertake a strategy of holding atmospheric concentrations to 550 parts uh, per million, which, by the way, is larger than I think probably most scientists would be comfortable with. Uh, and then the colored in area in between, that's the, that's the amount of the, so the magnitude of the reduction that the world would effectively be asking China to do in terms of uh, CO2 equivalent emissions. Now, so I think people are not used to thinking of uh, CO2 equivalent units of CO2 equivalent emissions. So one thing I did is I went and uh, looked at some of the models. And what one can back out of that is the projected loss of consumption uh, that China, we, the world would effectively be asking China to undertake. Uh, and if you used a discount rate uh, of uh, kind of a standard discount rate, uh, somewhere about three to five, somewhere in the three to five percent range, uh, and numbers obviously vary if it's three or five, the loss, the present value of the loss in consumption that we would effectively be asking China to undertake is about $50 trillion uh, over the course of the century. It's, a, uh, it's an incredibly large number. And I think that uh, makes, make, makes me think that uh, developing countries are unlikely to be very excited uh, about participating in this, uh, although the world, the controlling emissions is going to be dependent on it. So my next observation uh, is indeed uh, I've foreshadowed, which is that development countries are likely to be even less enthusiastic uh, than developed countries about reducing emissions. And there's a lot of ways to demonstrate this, uh, and pro uh, but you know sometimes just raw numbers provide a particularly stark way of uh, highlighting it. Uh, and so here you can see that the per capita income in developed countries versus developing countries is really uh, e enormously different. Uh, and you know a, a, I think a precise way of trying to say this is uh, so that we're at a really strange place which is where the good state of the world uh, uh, for developing countries, so that's the state of the world where they're able to raise their incomes uh, to the levels that approach the incomes that prevail in developed countries today, that's a good state of the world, is one where they get to emit a lot of carbon. Uh, and that's because that's the cheapest and best, uh, e easiest way for them to become wealthy. The problem, of course, is that that's the bad state of the world uh, for the planet and probably the bad state of the world uh, for developed countries. Uh, and so it is just to highlight that the very low incomes that prevail in developing countries today means uh, that there's necessarily going to be an emphasis uh, on increasing income today. In economic parlance, they just have a very high marginal utility of consumption, and that's going to make it difficult, I think, to get developing countries on board uh, for undertaking very large emissions reductions. Uh, my final observation uh, is just that in light of that, in light of all of, in light of these uh, few points, I'm not very optimistic about a mitigation strategy, uh, e even uh, though there, were, there are tremendous benefits associated with it. Uh, and so I think it's important that we begin to pull the stepchild of uh, climate policy out of the background, and that's ask ourselves, well, how ready is the planet uh, to address, uh, to confront large changes in climate? And so for this, just to, as one illustration of that, uh, I've drawn from uh, some of my own research here. Uh, and what this shows, uh, if you look to the right, there's the colored region. And th this is uh, from two studies, one of the United States and uh, one from India. And on the y-axis, we've got uh, the change in uh, the annual mortality rate. And on the x-axis, we have uh, the number of days that the temperature fell in uh, to these uh, 15 degree, uh, 15 temperature bins, each of which range uh, two degrees Celsius. And what I want you to take away from it is the blue line is the United States. And what one can see is that variation in temperature has basically no impact on the annual mortality rate in the United States. And that's because we're a rich country who's developed lots of ways to protect ourselves um, from environmental threats, even from hot temperatures. In contrast, if one looks at India, and that's the red line, 
what, what can, one can see is that they're, they're very vulnerable uh, to hot days. Uh, and uh, in, indeed, if you were to swap one, it, to switch out a day from the 22 to 24 range and suddenly put it to the 34 to 36 or greater than 36 range, which climate change is projected to do, the, uh, there could be impacts on mortality uh, that are as large as in, increase just from one extra day of one extra percentage point uh, in their annual mortality rate. Uh, and so I, I think this underscores the truism that we often hear that the costs of climate change are likely to be uh, the largest uh, in the developing countries. Uh, and all of this is a long way of saying uh, that I, I think adaptation needs to be a central part uh, of, our, of any suite of climate policies. And so just to conclude, uh, I think it's uh, evident that climate change is projected to lead to dramatic changes in the environment. Uh, global mitigation is challenging politically and economically. Uh, I think adaptation is the one policy that we're absolutely guaranteed to have to pursue. Uh, however, the playbook of successful adaptation strategies is small. Uh, but I think adaptation along with R&D, which has the potential to bring down the cost of low carbon energy, uh, must move higher on the policy agenda. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now that you're done, can you please, uh, on your control panel, uh, there's hopefully a command saying stop send slides. Uh, that is not, it, uh, we're working on that right now. Okay, good. Because if that is so, then your slides will disappear, and instead the audience here will see a nice, pretty picture of you on the screen. So don't, oh, well pick, your, don't pick your nose. I, I hope that's a good trade for the audience. Anyway, um, the question, just one question. Um, we, you've, you've sort of eloquently described all the political problems as other in the panel have done with mitigation. Well, what, may, maybe not, perhaps not everybody knows what you mean by adaptation. So can you please explain what adaptation is and why oh, sure. that would be politically more sort of feasible. Yeah, no, uh, sorry, I should have been clear about that. Uh, adaptation is just that the planet will change and humans will have to find ways uh, to it, uh, alter their behavior uh, to continue to live long lives. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I think we don't have a lot of evidence on great ways uh, to help people, especially in developing countries, identify successful adaptation strategies. Okay. We have a lot of issues and problems being discussed and we have some 15, 20 minutes to do that now. I suggest in a sense that we start with a provocation from Professor Sin uh, saying that much of the sort of recipes put forth in politics and by many economists intending to hike the price, lower demand, could be resulting in a paradox which is non-productive. I assume both uh, Nicholas Stern and perhaps Michael also have some comments to that, please. Close to the mic, please. I essentially agree with what Hans Werner Sin said about the uh, importance of quotas. I don't see how you can handle this with anything like the uh, confidence you'd need without some sort of uh, overall quotas um, which you'd have to um, allocate in some way. Um, countries themselves are starting to take on those quotas and that process has to be accelerated. It can happen and is happening without necessarily full formal agreement but it needs to be uh, accelerated. Um, but there's one thing I did also want to emphasize in all this, and I, I really appreciated what Elizabeth Moyer had to say. Economists just seem astonishingly complacent about the costs of climate change. Bill, Bill Nordhaus's model, and to give Bill credit, he's a scholar and a gentleman, he's changing. But the Bill's DICE model essentially has an 18 degrees centigrade increase, 18 degrees centigrade increase, a 50% loss in output. Uh, on the back of essentially uh, a growth rate underlying it. I mean, it cannot be credible. We'd be all be underground or dead or, you know, we haven't seen five degrees centigrade on this planet for 30 million years. It, it, we as Homo sapiens have been around for maybe 250,000. Uh, at five degrees centigrade, probably most of southern Europe would look like the Sahara Desert. We don't know exactly. We can't know 
exactly. We're talking at four or five degrees, six degrees centigrade of massive movements of people as whole parts of the planet get uninhabitable. To put in economic models, some small, you know, in the, a lot of these models, five degrees centigrade has a damage loss of maybe 5% of GDP. I mean, it's simply not a description that is helpful. We all know that models don't fit. Of course they don't. They wouldn't be models if they didn't fit. But is the model giving you something that captures the essence of the problem? And I think the answer in many of these things is a tremendous no. Um, one final point on what Hans, uh, Hans Werner had to say. There's a nice piece of work by Carbon Tracker which shows that if you take only the known reserves of hydrocarbons and they were burnt without carbon capture and storage, they'd be way over the amount that could possibly be consistent with a 50-50 chance of uh, 2 degrees centigrade. We have to recognize that you can't deal with this without leaving known reserves in the ground unless there's an unforeseen and very rapid expansion in carbon capture and storage, which looks possible. So we have to face up to the idea, as uh, Hans Werner Sen said very clearly, that um, uh, the policies will have to imply that known reserves of hydrocarbons will stay in the ground, and we have to work out some way of handling that. John, how do you model the price mechanism? Are economists in general, perhaps, or many policymakers um, have a mis misunderstanding or misconception on how the price mechanism works for scarce natural resources? Well, perhaps here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this relates to what, what, what Hans Werner said. And I think it is necessary to understand that there are different uh, uh, sources of fossil fuel. Hans Werner is talking mainly about cheap oil from Saudi Arabia, uh, which uh, most likely is going to be used and most likely should be used. Uh, and these are not going to be affected by, by, by taxes in, in reasonable, uh, at reasonable levels. I'm much more op optimistic uh, that uh, reasonable taxes in the order of the ones that we have in Sweden now, for example, would affect uh, the use of coal in the world. Uh, the average extraction cost of coal today is something in the order of 40, 40 to 45 dollars per ton. Um, and taxes of the sort that we have in Sweden would certainly make a lot of these, these extractions unprofitable. Uh, in, and I would say a lot, in, for example, in Europe. Of course, we cannot say whether these costs are going to fall dramatically over time, but, but at least currently, taxes on the use of coal would be effective. That, that I'm sure of. Not on oil, but that doesn't matter. Elizabeth? I just want to agree with the statement on, on oil, and it's not merely because uh, oil is more expensive per carbon molecule than coal is. It's because there are alternatives for what we use coal for, and we don't have good alternatives for what we use oil for. If you look at the U.S. energy diagram, essentially all the oil we get goes to transportation, and nothing other than oil goes to transportation. So we don't have any good alternative for mobile source, for mobile, for, for, for motion, other than liquid fuel right now. We could electrify. The only way you could push people out of oil is to electrify. And that's a very long process, and we don't have a cost-effective alternative right now. And the infrastructure is, is not in place for that. So the assumption with oil is that we will burn everything that's cheap, and the thing that eventually produces, we can't run, burn oil forever because there's a finite amount of it. So eventually the cost of extraction of hydrocarbons becomes less than the cost of an alternative technology. So you are looking at 50 years or so to electrify, but you're not driven by the policy, you're driven by the geology. Uh, and that's the assumption. And I think that's consistent with what other people are saying. Michael, do you want to join in in this discussion on pricing on scarce natural resources? Yeah, I, I, maybe I'll come at it from a slightly different angle, which I, I think Nick Stern just touched upon, uh, which is right now we're largely beholden to the models uh, in trying to estimate what the damages are. Uh, and the, as Nick said, the models really don't produce the kind of damages uh, that uh, I think Nick probably thinks are likely to happen. Uh, and since this is at least partially a celebration of economic research, I, I think there's a lot of room for uh, research into what the damage function actually looks like. You know, what would three degrees Celsius around the planet actually do? 
Uh, right now, the models say not that much, and I think that's why it produces not that large changes. Uh, but I think it's an area that we need to know more about. But that is gradually happening, I assume, that researchers work on this. It is, but I would like to point out, as a climate scientist coming into this field, one of the things I was astounded by is the differential funding levels, you know, and also the, the, the practices in the fields. Uh, climate science is, is run by large groups uh, with, with large sums of money because it takes a lot of people to, to build one of these big models, and it takes a lot of money to pay a lot of people to do that. And I don't think impacts will make progress unless it has the same model. It's sometimes for a complicated job. It just takes a lot of people. And the funding base has not been there. It's been really shocking to me to see how few people are involved in a typical impacts model. When we're used to teams of hundreds. Hans, Hans yeah, sorry. sorry, Hans Werner, do you want to respond to these uh, challenges? Well, these were not challenges, really. To I, some I saw extent. That, <laughs> saw that as At a, least from as, John. As, as mm -hmm. a support to some extent. Um, I mean, we have to become clear that prices um, <coughs> for natural resources, and here we talk about fossil carbon, are not the same as prices for uh, reproducible uh, goods. Hmm? So if I have a tax on, on car production, okay, then the production goes down because the price is equal to the, to the cost of producing the car and then it's no longer attractive. But natural resources is more like, 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 like old paintings, old Rembrandts, you know? I can impose a tax on old Rembrandts that will not reduce the number of Rembrandts around. No? Uh, the price of, an, of a Rembrandt has, 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 has very little to do with the cost of the paint of the, of the painter. It's a scarcity price. And uh, since we are talking here about scarcity prices, we, we cannot simply, simply by, uh, by uh, imposing taxes achieve something. This analogy is, is not, simply not true. Uh, I agree there are uh, definitions of, of, of tax rates where the tax is equal to the present value of the marginal damage from now to infinity if you really get it, get it to that point and, and follow the resulting time path. Yes, right. But who can do that? No one can do that. In practical terms, uh, you, you, you're unable to design uh, a, a carbon tax that, that, that really works well. I, I do buy the thing with coal, yes, maybe. But, you, you know, the coal price is very low nowadays also because we have alternatives. We have gas, we have oil. Uh, <laughs> think of the post-oil uh, era. Then the price will be going up for coal. And... Uh, I could very well imagine a scenario where um, the cost as a fraction of the price for coal is dropping over time. And so how, in that scenario, what can you do with uh, just uh, demand reducing measures that reduce the price a little bit? So this is theoretically a very difficult thing. And uh, I'm fully agreeing with uh, Nick. The only thing that works is quantity constraints rather than price signals. Price signals are useless. Yes, Liz, first, a short comment, then you. I just want to say that the coal price can't rise indefinitely because there is a, there is a ceiling, and the ceiling is set by carbon-free technology. If you can do... So Michael thinks that doing wind at 8 cents per kilowatt hour is really expensive, which it is in some sense, but on the other hand, you know, if energy sector is a couple percent of GDP, 7% of GDP, and you raise the retail price by 50%, that's, you know, 3% of GDP, that's not a bad thing. So you're not going to get coal prices going through the roof because people will use something else. The problem with oil is just that we don't have an else that is reasonable. I wanted to say a word or two more about the damage functions, but then come back to the case I was making because I think it would be, it would be good if the uh, social scientists and the scientists sat down together a little bit more effectively to really get their heads around the different kinds of damages that could occur. The different kinds of damages that could occur. That's not the same thing as an aggregate damage function. We're talking about massive movements of people potentially. We're talking about conflicts which could arise from masses these very big movements of people. We should describe them as best we can. 
But the idea that we can knock that whole thing into uh, some fraction of GDP and get a useful description for policy of the problem, I have big questions over. I would rather, in that discussion, have a, um, a clear idea of just how big these dangers are ask ourselves, as we do in insurance, what would we pay to avoid those kinds of implications? Pretty quickly, you're going to get to a, an answer that says it's likely to be well below uh, concentration in the, in the medium term of 550 parts per million CO2, ideally much lower than that. As a result of thinking carefully about the consequences, you realize that you can do this at significant cost, economic cost, but actually cost which is manageable and has all these other kinds of benefits that I'm talking about. If you do it that way, not calculate a new damage function, but if you do it that way, then the, the economic research and the policy making turns to how can you get onto a path like that? How can you promote an energy industrial revolution? How can you break the link between energy emission and emission? Because if you don't break the link between energy and emissions, you're not going to do it. So I, I would prefer to see the research go that way. Good collaboration but about understanding damages and at the same time, and even more important in my view, uh, how we accelerate that energy industrial revolution. I certainly don't want to quarrel with Mike about the importance of adaptation. We're moving so slowly that adaptation is going to be extremely important. But uh, as the language is that what we're doing in mitigation is avoiding the unmanageable and um, in what we're doing in adaptation is managing the unavoidable. I think that language is quite helpful in understanding what we're trying to do. Michael, I think you were waving. You want to add something before we go into the final round? So, you know, I, listen, I'm a card-carrying economist, uh, and I'm all on board that we should have a quota uh, for carbon emissions. Uh, I think I, I just want to underscore what I saw as one theme in my talk, uh, which is, that quota only works if the whole world is inside. Uh, and I just, it's, let me just repeat it. I think the good state of the world for the developing countries is the bad state of the world for the planet. Because the good state of the world for them is that they got to get rich. Uh, and they, the best way and the easiest way for them to get rich is through lots of carbon emissions. Thank you. Uh, time is uh, approaching the end rapidly. I'd like you to, if you want to, add a final one minute short speech each to summarize your views on this panel and advice to the Minister of Environmental Affairs. And we go the same way we did from the outset. So, make your first. Um, I, I think the power of the example to try to put together uh, programs for reducing emissions, projects which could catch people's imagination and be followed. I think you'd find a ready, uh, ready collaboration in other parts of the developing world, particularly in China where uh, we know that um, the, uh, in Stockholm and uh, between Stockholm and China you already have quite strong collaboration. So really good examples that could spread um, would be my uh, recommendation. John? Uh, uh, first on the quote, quota issue, I think that the, uh, uh, that is uh, a more difficult question and, and I think that there are mer clear merits of, of, of taxes uh, in, uh, under some fairly reasonable assumptions you need more information in order to be able to write the right uh, quota. Quotas imply uh, shadow prices that, that vary a lot over time, that seems to be inefficient, we see that now in Europe. Um, so I, I would not be so clear there. Regarding damages, I, I clearly agree with Nick that so far we know absolutely too little. The damage function that we, that we have that we put into our models typically yield fairly uh, small damages for, for at least for, for if you talk about three, four, five degrees. Uh, and in particular for, 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 uh, for the developed countries. That is, in a sense, is a problem because we have some reason to believe that we cannot trust this, at least not uh, to be sufficiently sure that these are the right figures to trust, uh, and in, in particular for extrapolations. I disagree with Nick because I think we need to at least bound, set some bounds on these costs. We need to price. People are not convinced to undertake uh, the necessary uh, 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 um, measures unless we have put some price on these things. 
Yes. So I felt like I said my piece before, and no one's talked about geoengineering, so I'll give you just one minute on geoengineering. Um, so the geophysicist spiel on geoengineering uh, is that it requires too much trust in your government, because if you put a carbon, what you're doing with geoengineering is you're counteracting, you're trying to counteract the effect of a carbon molecule. But the carbon you put in the atmosphere, about 30% of it will stay for 10,000 years. So that means whatever you do, you have to do for 10,000 years, because the geoengineering alternative, the, typically the, the reflectivity changes you make to the Earth last only a matter of months. So you're trusting your government to do the right thing for 10,000 years. And I know Sweden is extremely competent, and you guys have lots of faith in your government. But we in the U.S. don't have that kind of faith. So <laughs> that's, that's the geoengineering fear, is that, is that it requires too much for too long. I'll say that. You need a price in order to uh, change the behavior of people. But you won't be able to impress the oil shakes with a price. That is the difficulty. So for that reason, you need a cap and trade system which limits the quantities and creates the price signals for the people. And Michael? Yeah, I'll just close the two points. Uh, I think, uh, I, I think base, funding a basic R&D needs to be higher on the agenda. I, I think it's probably a little bit of a long shot, but it's absolutely critical to get the cost of low carbon energy down as much as possible. Uh, it's going to be especially challenging because it's going to be have, probably have to be done in the absence uh, of a world price for carbon. So you're asking guys to produce products for which there really isn't a market. Uh, but that we should s s devote a lot of energy to that. Uh, the second thing, is just to, which is really the thesis of my talk, is, uh, and I think Nick put a good point on it, which is that we're going to have to adapt, and that's going to involve a bunch of things that are uncomfortable, including the massive movements of people, and I think we should probably begin to understand how to do that in a way uh, that is palatable. It's possibly death-defying and stupid to try to summarize a panel discussion and the presentations we've heard, but it's difficult to go away from here and be very optimistic. I mean, we've heard that the environmental challenges are perhaps even worse than we thought, many of us. Uh, we seem all to agree that policy responses so far are not sufficient. We've had a big discussion on taxes versus quota. And, and it seems that many people agree that quantity constraints are very important, but hopefully, or preferably then, should, they should be global. But that leads to a sort of depressing political conclusion because if we have seen lack in political responses so far, it seems even more difficult to get to a a state where we have global quotas, unfortunately. So the only obvious conclusion, of course, is that adaptation is definitely necessary, hoping for better times to come, and good examples, like Nid said, and more funding, like Nid said. So <laughs> obviously the Institute has another lifespan of 50 years or so, looking forward to exciting research issues, at least in this area. And with that, I'd like to leave the floor for a one or two minute comment from our Minister of Environmental Affairs. Did you learn anything less depressing? Did you learn anything uplifting from this discussion? Um, let's say I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, it's fascinating uh, being a lawyer in international public law myself and participated in, I think, by this time, nine uh, climate negotiation rounds within the UN system in various functions to listen to this and, and uh, of course what I'm thinking is that uh, the traditional um, ec economy has, and I'm, I'm thinking back to the Nobel laureate prices or the prices of the Swedish Riksbank for, for economy, is that psychology has moved in as a factor and uh, also that the discussion on the uh, community good has moved in as a factor. And I think if I compare the discussions this afternoon with the uh, climate negotiations, when I meet uh, fellow ministers from India, China, US, uh, South Africa, Indonesia, and Malawi, of course they all have uh, different starting points. But I think the psychology within uh, a good number of governments is that this issue is really pressing and it will cost them dearly and the price of waiting is very, very high. 
And for every month, of course, adaptation becomes more important. And adaptation in, in um, uh, a sea state in the Pacific is, of course, uh, uh, something that you have to deal with right now. If, if your only airport is two decimeters above the average uh, water level, of course, you have to do something. Uh, in Germany, it's not that pressing, but then psychology kicks in. <laughs> And, of course, the, the leadership. And like in all companies and in all technology shifts, we find companies who surf on the wave in a technology shift and those who lose out. And I think uh, that is uh, one of the problems that we face within the UN system to sort of bring everyone on board and, and uh, not to work with the lowest common denominator in a multi multi-disciplinary uh, system, but to see that we have to act and act where we can and act where the pricing is, is um, working our way. I totally agree that the price is extremely important and I think um, for me this afternoon has been uh, real, really interesting and extremely valuable as we now prepare for the big rounds, both on the, to expand the coalition on short-lived climate pollutants, but also when we prepare for the next round with it, the conference of the parties and the climate convention. So I would like to thank you very much, and it's a joy to see experts like this in Stockholm, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so. That, that concludes this panel, but as we can see, the director of the Institute, Professor Harry Flam, wants to say some famous final words. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank all the participants, both in this panel and the previous panel, for their wisdom and uh, the effort and time they put into this. And to all conference participants, both in the Growth and Development uh, Conference and the uh, economy and climate conference that is starting today. Uh, this ends this afternoon's uh, uh, program. Uh, there are refreshments outside. Uh, uh, minors should take non-alcoholic refreshments. Thank you very much. <laughs>